All right, guys, so in order to understand what actually happened to Robert Whitaker's jaw, we have to watch a little bit of how they set this up and understand sort of the biomechanics and the anatomy associated with it. So if you guys remember, I mean, it was a pretty quick tap once he sunk in, once he got that grip on the opposite bicep. And for those of you who trained jiu-jitsu, you could probably tell pretty immediately he just tapped to what seemed like a neck crank or a, in this case a jaw crank, but actually ended up breaking his jaw as we've seen up until this point. So whenever he grabs, when Kamzat Chimaev grabs the other arm, he creates a lot of leverage in order to create a posterior and anterior to posterior force into the front of his jaw. And like most of you know who do train, you want to try to get the bend of the elbow around the neck in order to occlude both arteries. And that's how we know this isn't a choke, because you can see the bend of his elbow is not actually attached to his neck. It's actually the lateral border of the radius. So a lot of people call it the blade of the radius whenever you're talking about chokes like the anaconda or the darse. But in order to understand why this anterior to posterior movement is so important, you have to kind of understand how it moves. So the tympomandibular joint of the jaw has four main movements. You can protract the jaw, which is essentially just bringing the jaw forward, what would be considered an underbite, bringing the jaw backwards or creating an overbite, bringing the jaw towards your neck, elevating the jaw, bringing your teeth a little bit closer to one another, and then depressing the jaw or essentially opening your mouth or bringing the teeth further away from one another. And why this is so important to understand is because if we look and we see that really good leverage that Kamzat have with his other bicep and he's pulling an anteriorly to posteriorly on Ritiker's jaw, we can see that if, once we start to look at the anatomy, it starts to make sense. So this muscle or this bone here is called the mandible and this ultimately ends up being what fractured on Whitaker. Now, if we look at the actual joint, this is how we understand why this fractured. So this is the mandible and this is the temporal bone of the cranium. So that's why it's called TMJ or the tempo mandibular joint. And if we let this play, this is actually jaw retraction. So we can see it move back, pay attention right here. Boom. So it stops there because there's actually a bony end. We call this a bony end feel. So this joint literally can't go back anymore or it just runs into the posterior portion of that joint of the tympomandibular joint. So if we zoom out, we can then understand that when his blade of the forearm or the radius, the lateral border of the radius was essentially kind of cutting across the front of the mandible and pushing backwards, we could easily see that when we saw that depression back into his mouth where there, there were three or four teeth that were still there, it likely fractured here and here. Now we don't know, uh, but I did pull up an x-ray to show you kind of what would happen. This is a panoramic x-ray, so it doesn't look like a real jaw because it's, got, it's capturing all the teeth. But if you look down here to the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you can see the separation of the integrity of the joint of the jaw or the, the mandible. This is called a radiolucency, which just means that the bone, there's, there's a separation in the integrity of the bone or the mandible. Uh, and there's also one up here if you want to look at that. This is not representative of the fracture that Robert Whitaker had, I don't think. Uh, again, we don't know. But it is, I mean, is confirmed a fracture, obviously, after seeing some of those pictures. Uh, but that's essentially kind of what it looks like whenever we're looking at a jaw fracture. Uh, and all of these, these biomechanical and anatomical properties uh, play a huge role in when someone taps, which was very quick in Robert Whitaker's situation because he had absolutely no choice unless he wanted his jaw to be further fucked up, essentially. So that's how we can understand the role of anatomy when it comes to injury in certain situations like this. All right, so before I let you go, I just I forgot to say something about this. This is something that I just wanted you to kind of take note of. These are the, the representation of maybe some of the wiring mechanisms that are, are typically used whenever they want to refixate a jaw uh, back into place. Uh, he's, he's very likely gonna have to have something like this done. It's not gonna be as extensive because he just had kind of the front of his jaw, uh, the anterior portion of his jaw kind of pushed posteriorly. We saw that with his teeth. Uh, but this is kind of representative of something that he might have, especially here in the front. He, he didn't have any issues up at the top. Uh, but having his jaw wired like this 
and likely washed up because they can't move. Bones typically take six to eight weeks to heal. Uh, and not to mention the fact that these little holes right here represent where nerves, we're not gonna talk about the nerves, but where nerves come out and give um, motor innervation to some muscles around there and maybe even sensory innervation. So there could be just a plethora of issues that he undergoes here. It's not gonna be an easy recovery by any means. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, whenever you're thinking about those injuries and thinking about his injury and his recovery, if it takes a little longer, it's probably because he's got some wires in his mouth.